I wanted to sort of just as a kind of a jumping off point, um, sort of explain sort of a bit more about um, how I began working on on the book and and why, and it was sort of really came down to this sort of central question of of was Putin an accidental president as he is uh, so often portrayed in the media? Was it just by chance? And and what really happened to uh, the networks of the security services? What happened to the KGB at the Soviet fall? And how was it that that Putin was able to sort of rise so rapidly to the president? No doubt there was, some of it was, was to do with chance, but a lot of it wasn't also. And I really, it really seemed to me from all the, my years of reporting that we didn't really understand completely what had happened at the, at the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union. It was a time of such tumultuous change um, that, and everything was happening so rap rapidly that there was a lot of stuff that kind of got uh, brushed over that was lost in, in the immense change of the times. So I wanted to kind of take time to go back and, and look at what was going on then. And it had always seemed to me a slightly naive and over optimistic view to just kind of write the, the, the kind of the security services to write off the KGB as a, as a collapsed force at, this, at, the, at the Soviet collapse, that they would just have dropped everything and sort of given up the fight against the West, even after decades of fighting the imperial foe. Most Russians I know are very stubborn. They're not just going to to give up uh, like that overnight. So it just seemed to me that this was very over-optimistic and it was over-optimistic as well. And slightly a, a fallacy that, that sort of all the asset siphoning was just about kind of filling pockets, that it was pure kleptocracy and there was nothing more going on. So I had this really great opportunity to take some time off and sort of speak to some of my contacts more in depth and, and make many new ones. And, and sort of what I found as, as often in these cases is that the, the answers to the questions, they weren't black and white, but it was, it was, yeah, it was very interesting to do. And sort of what I found was, was really that it was uh, kind of, uh, it became apparent that there were progressive elements within the KGB in the 80s who had really been the first to recognize that uh, the Soviet command economy was not going to be competitive against the West, that there had to be change in order to continue this, this global competition against the West. One of the former operatives told me, he said, look, if you're going to have ambitions to be a great empire, you have to be able to, to spend a lot of money. It was very clear to us that if we continued with the command economy, we were never going to be able to, to beat the US. So what became apparent as I began to research more that it was within this sort of more progressive element of the KGB that the drive for reform, the perestroika drive, some of it began, of course, uh, in the domestic sections of the KGB. This was the sort of the more heavy handed, meat headed types who were only about imposing political control at home, about controlling dissidents and so on. But within the foreign intelligence director of the directorate, there were a lot more kind of nimble and very able people who traveled wildly. Uh, they could see how far the Soviet economy was lagging behind the West. And really, they knew that there had to be some change. So I began looking at some of the institutions uh, where uh, where some of the perestroika reforms had began and it became apparent that a lot of them were staffed by kind of uh, quite senior members of, of foreign intelligence and a case in point was the Institute of World Economy in the south of Moscow and this really became a central hub for some of the perestroika reforms and it was there that the sort of the reform to allow joint ventures began. This was a really kind of crucial move which allowed foreign capital into the Soviet economy and it allowed uh, sort of to crack open competition in, in, in Soviet foreign trade and for a long time efforts to bring in this reform which were first made in the late 70s they were kind of brushed aside and ignored uh, but when uh, Gorbachev came to power and Alexander Yakovlev uh, returned from Canada the former Soviet ambassador to Canada he became head of this institute and the reforms uh, really really began and then uh, after Yakovlev was swiftly moved to the the Politburo uh, Yevgeny Primakov who became the the next head of Russia's foreign intelligence he took 
took over at the Institute. And under his watch, the Institute of World Economy became a real hub for some of these uh, perestroika reforms before, for the shift to a market economy. And, and really what we saw happen uh, as the reforms progressed, uh, that it was also the KGB who were cultivating the first young entrepreneurs of the Soviet era, the Khodorkovsky types, Mikhail Friedman, Patanin and co, the, these sort of first members of the Komsomol who were allowed to dabble in kind of market transactions. They wouldn't have been able to do anything without support from these progressive elements in the KGB. Uh, most of them made their first money importing computers and a lot of the technology they were bringing in was in fact under a Western embargo against dual use technology being imported into the Soviet Union and, and they wouldn't have been able to, to do any of it if they'd not been allowed access to some of the smuggling networks of the KGB to bypass this embargo um, when they began moving into commodities trade as well. Again, it was the KGB that had kept control of, of much of the Soviet trade ministry and you weren't allowed to do anything without their say-so. And indeed, when I was speaking to Khodorkovsky after his release from jail back in 2014, he himself admitted that very often in these early operations, he, he was being told what to do. He said, I was being asked, to, could you do this? Could you do that? He would never say who those masters were, but he certainly believed he had them. And it wasn't till 1993 that he finally realized that actually this company, it's my own, I own it, I can, I can do what I like. But for a while he felt like he was following other people's orders. And obviously, as you well know yourselves, the, the perestroika reform period began, began to, uh, the process began to, to spin out of control. Everyone was sort of trying to join the gold rush. The KGB tried to keep uh, control of the oil trade in particular, but everything was moving faster and faster. Gorbachev tried to slow things down. He who always had this sort of dream of, of a market reform with a, a socialist face in which he would can keep on top of the system and, and keep control. But even the progressives within the KGB, they began to tire of Gorbachev's efforts to, to rein in the reforms. And one of them said to me that we could see that under Gorbachev, the, the transition, the market reforms would be as effective as, as fried snowballs, that it wasn't going to get them anywhere if they kept Gorbachev uh, in power. So one by one, some of them began to switch sides. They began uh, supporting the, the rising force of Yeltsin. Uh, uh, among them, again, was Alexander Yakovlev, who had been the great mentor of Gorbachev. He began joining and supporting Yeltsin. Uh, another was Viktor Chebrikov, the former KGB chief. Um, one by one, they began moving. And again, we have this very curious situation in the August 91 hardline coup, um, when ostensibly Vladimir Kruchkov, the KGB chief, was a member of the hardline coup faction, and yet he never gave the order to arrest Yeltsin, even though there were numerous opportunities to do so. I was, uh, I spoke to one member of the KGB alpha unit that was following Yeltsin after he flew in from Kazakhstan after the coup was announced, and they, they could have arrested him at the airport, and then they hid in the bushes outside Yeltsin's dacha, just waiting for the order to come while Yeltsin was sort of deliberating still what to do. The order never came and he was allowed to go unhindered to the White House, where indeed uh, he, he, he led the protests against the hardline coup. And again, when the order was finally given to fire on the White House, of course, the KGB alpha unit also resisted and eventually they stood down. And I was sort of told that uh, sort of one of the reasons that the, 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 that revolution happened without much bloodshed was because, you know, these sort of elements within the KGB and, and other sort of not the very top of the Politburo, of course, but other elements could see that they could live better and they stood better chances of, of competing uh, globally eventually if, if they uh, allowed the coup to continue. Um, so if they allowed Yeltsin to take over, sorry. So um, 
And also um, the other element that we haven't looked at is of course it was the KGB, it was the foreign intelligence members of the KGB who began uh, sort of recommending to the Communist Party that uh, they create a, a hidden invisible economy uh, uh, to, for, to, to survive in a, in a market economy, they began helping the Communist Party siphon out assets out of the Soviet Union, mostly through raw materials deals, but also through currency trading and so on. And they were creating all these joint ventures uh, in the West and also uh, kind of very, through various trading firms and, and, and other companies through which this, this money was siphoned. And indeed, after the collapse of the hardline coup and the Soviet Communist Party was banned, there was these elements of progressive elements of the KGB who knew where all the money was borrowed buried, they had the keys to the accounts. No doubt a lot of it was stolen, but uh, some of it was still under the control of the foreign intelligence networks. And it was Yevgeny Primakov who was immediately appointed the head of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service. It was, it was Primakov who was sort of leading the cover-up and blocking any attempts to investigate what happened to the, the Communist Party wealth. So there was certainly a, a great sum of money that disappeared into the West. Um, and then also, um, I think what we can see uh, very much in, in Putin's own career, we can see uh, quite a lot of, of, of how, how this uh, kind of this progression really um, as well. Um, obviously, when Putin is in, was in Dresden, a lot has been said uh, and written previously about how he was a nobody then, um, you know, and the very fact uh, that he was working in Dresden spoke to the fact that he had kind of no future, no career. It was just such a backwater. And all he did there was write senseless reports and, and drank a lot of beer. And, and really, um, if, if you would look, if when, what I found when I looked at what was going on in, in Dresden a bit more closely was that actually it was uh, one of the central hubs for smuggling embargoed technology into the West. It was very active in this field. They had a big uh, uh, computer uh, producer called Robotron, uh, which had already very successfully cloned the IBM. And it was also uh, a place where uh, a lot of, of smuggling transactions were going on in which uh, the Stasi was also preparing in case of collapse and they were, or they were also siphoning money ahead of uh, an expected uh, or in case of a collapse of the East German regime and one of the there was a kind of infamous transaction in, in which uh, a, a hard disk plant was being built in Turingen near Dresden and it was the most expensive such undertaking uh, ever 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 put together in, in East Germany and yet it was never built a lot of the components disappeared um, and 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 it was run by a Stasi agent named Martin Schlaff. Uh, and a lot of the funds, uh, tens of millions of Deutschmarks were, were diverted from this project into Liechtenstein and Singapore, Singapore companies that he ran. And he eventually employed former Stasi foreign intelligence chiefs in his companies. And there were a lot of uh, investigations by the German Bundestag into what he was up to and sort of where the money disappeared to. But it, it was very much look that he was uh, kind of an integral part of, of siphoning cash that would allow Stasi networks to continue operating even after a regime change. We don't know, uh, there are no documents that would suggest that Putin was involved in any of this process because the KGB was very able, uh, a very ably managed to destroy uh, almost all the documents pertaining to their activities uh, in Dresden uh, at, at that time, they just destroyed an awful lot of documents before protests uh, reached uh, their their kind of their 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 office and, and so on. So. Um, 
Yes, um, but what we did see was that Schla Martin Schlaff, this agent who was involved in the, in, in the money transfers to preserve the Stasi networks, he much later appeared as a key cog in Gazprom's financial empire in Austria, sort of much later under the, the Putin regime. So you can see these sort of elements of, of continuity in some of the networks. And one of the things that German intelligence was also looking at when Putin rose to the presidency was whether he had been part of uh, this Operation Luch, which no doubt you will have heard of, which the KGB, again, these progressive elements of the KGB, again, understanding that they were sort of holding on to power, that communism sort of was becoming untenable, that the protest and the, the kind of the wave of dissent was no longer going, they weren't going to be able to contain it. They were preparing for regime change and they were ordering operatives uh, to like Putin to start recruiting uh, uh, politicians from the second and third tier who could continue to operate for the Soviets or the Russians after uh, a regime change. And really German intelligence uh, were questioning a lot of, of Putin's old contacts from Dresden because they believed that he was part of this operation. And indeed it looks like that Putin was in close contact with the uh, SED leader in Dresden, Hans Modro, who had also kind of been kind of picked by the Soviets as a, as a new leader that they wanted to take over from, from Honecker. Putin is in some of the few remaining documents he's listed as, as the party secretary of position that would have indeed put him into contact with Modro then. So you could see these sort of little elements that one, the KGB was clearly preparing for uh, a transition to the market and this was also going on in, in East Germany when Putin was in Dresden. So you could see these efforts to preserve networks even before the Soviet fall. And then what Putin, uh, what happened with Putin when he returned to the Soviet Union was also a kind of illustrated this uh, tendency as well. Obviously he was told by his former mentor not to stay uh, in Moscow. He was told to go to Lenin Grad, where immediately he began to sort of attach himself to, to the new leaders of, of the city's democracy. His first approach was to Galina Starovoitova, one of the most kind of rousing speakers in the democratic movement. He was rebuffed, but his next attempt was much more successful. He was appointed assistant to his former mentor, as you know, at the Leningrad uh, University, uh, where he became Anatoly Sobchak's uh, deputy in and soon after uh, Sobchak was elected the mayor of the city. So he had this great position in the shadows uh, kind of, of, the, of, the, of, of the country's democracy movement. And this was kind of illustrative of a, a wider uh, trend. I mean, in, instead of uh, the KGB just giving up, there, were, uh, quite a, there was quite a considerable element that remained in the shadows, that shadowed closely the, the democratic leaders as, as Putin was uh, in St. Petersburg. And the other, the real kind of breakthrough revelation for me came when I began looking more closely at the oil for food deals in St. Petersburg that you've obviously all he heard about sort of the great scandal surrounding them. It was widely believed that, that Putin uh, was engineering these oil for food deals. He was handing out licenses uh, to barter oil products for food which never arrived in St. Petersburg, that he was handing out licenses and huge amounts of very valuable commodities to his cronies to enable them to sort of just line their own pockets and siphon the wealth. But I managed to find um, a former KGB operative who'd worked with Putin on these schemes. And actually what he described was obviously, yes, it was a mechanism to steal money, but it also had a, a bigger agenda behind it. He, so this guy is, is Philippe Torova, and uh, he was kind of from the elite of, of the foreign intelligence. And he described a process in which these barter schemes were underway on a federal 
federal level essentially to pay uh, friendly firms. And as you remember, the friendly firms in Soviet times were a way uh, the Communist Party and the KGB used to funnel money to fund uh, kind of influence and political operations abroad. The friendly firms supplied equipment to the Soviet Union, whether it was for the nuclear industry or the oil industry, very often at vastly inflated prices and they would keep the difference and fund uh, Soviet Communist Party operations abroad and also um, uh, and, and other influence operations as well. And they had this network of friendly firms remained after the Soviet collapse, but there were huge debts apparently owed to them. And these barter schemes, I was told, were set up as a way to uh, pay the debts. Uh, the Soviet Union and Russia had declared itself bankrupt. Uh, any money that was in foreign state bank accounts had been frozen. All the money of Neshikonom Bank had been frozen. So if the, the city of St. Petersburg wanted to hold officially foreign bank accounts, they were also going to be frozen too because there was a debt moratorium. And basically the KGB operatives wanted to find a way to continue funding the, the friendly firms to pay off debts or fund, continue to fund intelligence operations through the barter scheme. So rather than the, the money just sort of disappearing to, to buy yourself a Dacia or an expensive car, it was actually going to fund the intelligence networks. And it was these, these so they, were, they were creating strategic slush funds uh, in a way where there was no line between sort of what you could use for your personal use and what was used for for strategic operations because there, there was just no oversight and really what was happening became a model on which the the Putin regime was later run just smuggling and asset siphoning where cash is used for both strategic operations and to help yourself live a, a, a great lifestyle um, so this it was very interesting to to look at all this um and obviously as you know well in in the 90s of course uh uh the the foreign intelligence operatives the the kgb um sort of they weren't able to keep control of the process in the 90s. The, the young tycoons who they'd helped create, like Khodorkovsky, Mikhail Friedman and Patanin, were much more nimble than they were. And eventually they were able to sort of escape and eclipse their former KGB masters. And uh, obviously the big turning point came, the, the big turning point in ownership came with the loan for share schemes. Uh, up till that point, the, the foreign intelligence operatives had still been able to keep control of, of much of the oil export network in conjunction with the red directors but once all for the loan for sh loans for share scheme occurred uh, obviously ownership was no was out of their hands the young tycoons had taken over and it was that was the moment of course which sort of created this great bitterness among the kind of KGB members it was they were sort of you know they they felt that the young oligarchs had forgotten to whom they owed their early careers to whom they owed a debt um, so you know it was it was this kind of time bomb it was the, the it was the, the time when you know obviously at some point they were going to exact revenge um, but while the young tycoons were taking over in Moscow there was uh, still quite a considerable uh, KGB element behind the scenes in the Kremlin administration. Uh, a lot of the bureaucrats had uh, ties to security services. There had been no illustration, of course, uh, in Yeltsin's Russia because probably there would be very you couldn't there would be very few officials that hadn't cooperated at some time or other with the KGB. So the argument was that there'd be nobody left to to run the government. The young reformers, of course, made a a, a valiant effort. To, uh, bringing the market to Russia but actually they were never in the majority in Yeltsin's government and even people like Yegor Gaidar who, who the great liberal had made great efforts also early on in the Yeltsin government to continue funding foreign intelligence networks there was one operation I think that was uh, he concocted a, a 200 million dollar uh, barter scheme with Cuba to sell oil for sugar with Cuba to keep the, the Lord's list station running uh, and that was at the same time as the the Russian budget overall was 165 million dollars yet 200 million dollars was getting siphoned through a barter scheme to fund the Lord's listening station so they they 
kept these priorities even as they were kind of on the on the course for reform and obviously with, with Putin as well we see in his career once he made it to the Kremlin from St Petersburg he made this very rapid rise through the Kremlin as you know he was always very unassuming uh, you know he I was told by Yumashev one of the things that he remembered about him was his lack apparent lack of ambition I think when Putin was head of the control department in the Kremlin he was already deputy head of the Kremlin uh, administration he told Yumashev that he thought he'd done enough perhaps he should resign and move on to something else that he didn't think he'd be able to achieve anymore and this had sort of you know Yamashev was was impressed by this lack of ambition and he was also impressed by his loyalty and sort of how he would uh, you know the lengths he went to to uh, help his former mentor Anatoly Sobchak in escape criminal investigation Putin whisked him off on a plane uh, across the border so he could escape scrutiny from other hardline elements of the security forces and this really also greatly impressed Yumashev. Uh, he told me that he was willing to take such lengths to, to protect someone. Um, and But obviously we get to 99 and the story that you know very well when the Yeltsin family was absolutely under fire uh, following the August financial collapse and what made things worse for them was uh, the fact that there was a, an operation underway to uh, kind of find Kompromat against the Yeltsin family and indeed this operation which was another discovery for me uh, when I was working on the book this operation was being led uh, by uh, the foreign intelligence operatives and it was Philippe Torova, the same guy who'd worked with Putin on the oil for food de deals, who become a whistleblower on the fact that the Yeltsin family held credit cards issued by a construction company which had been awarded a multi-billion dollar contract to reconstruct the Kremlin. As you well know, Mebitex, Mebitex, the company had issued the Yeltsin family with credit cards, perhaps they realized they were spending uh, other people's money perhaps they didn't I was told that the Yeltsin daughters thought they were spending Papa's royalties and that they weren't on the hook for any money that they spent then but they had spent uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars which is small change compared to today's corruption scandals but in those days when the Yeltsin administration was under fire the Duma was still dominated by the communists and of course uh, you know, there was there was an in, intense uh, kind of dislike of the Yeltsin family, particularly after the, the August financial collapse. They really were in trouble. And the law of those times were that if a, a Russian official held a foreign bank account, it was indeed against the law. And what the foreign intelligence had been hoping under Plan A was that Yevgeny Primakov was meant to stand up uh, during impeachment hearings and say, look, here's the evidence the president is a thief. Um, event Primakov never did this. So perhaps he was he was Plan A, but in the background was Putin a Plan B? It's a big question. I'm not sure um, they were that clever, but certainly there was a combination of sort of political rivalries, sheer coincidence, and the fact that Putin was so skillful in assuring the Yeltsin family that he was the one who was who would save them, that he was the one who was loyal enough to kind of fend off the attacks from the communists and that he was the one who was sort of liberal and progressive, certainly compared to Primakov. He convinced them very ably that he was one of them. So the Primakov gambit, it didn't work, but uh, Putin was in the background. He was charming. Obviously, as you know, Yeltsin had first appointed Stepashin as prime minister. He could have been the one that could have taken over, um, but um, as you know, they made a switch at the last minute and I've 
that I've looked very closely at this whole story and, and really it seems to me that Yumashev and Dechenko had been convinced that Stepashin was too weak, he wouldn't be able to save them from the mounting investigations into the youth family's use of the credit card. Swiss prosecutors were escalating a probe as were Russian prosecutors at home and they had been convinced that Stepashin wasn't strong enough to save them, but Putin was the one with his ally uh, in the security services, uh, it was Patrushev. Putin was head of the Security Council. He was busy opening criminal cases against another rival, against the wife of, of Yuri Lushkov, the Moscow mayor. And they really believed that they were sort of safe in Putin's hands. And was this an operation? <laughs> I'm not sure we'll ever know, but he very ate well, sort of if Primakov was the sort of the scary communist dinosaur, uh, Putin was the, was the in the background charming them and sort of winning them over and essentially sort of painting himself as a, a liberal progressive who was one of them. Um, they feared a communist coup then, but what they really fell victim to was a creeping coup by the security men. Um, in any case, at that stage, the Yeltsin administration was in so much trouble after the financial crisis. Once they'd been backed into appointing Primakov as, as prime minister initially, there was no way back. They had to appoint someone from the security services. So you were faced with this choice of three kind of different extremes. The, Primakov, the, the communist dinosaur, Stepashin, sort of the, the woolly liberal of, of the security forces, and, and Putin, who was the wolf in sheep's clothing. He was the liberal, the progressive, but actually he was from a four far more ruthless faction of, of KGB men who sort of forged themselves in the violence and sort of mafia networks of St. Petersburg who were, were to prove a lot more ruthless than, than anyone else. And the rest, as you know, is history. Um, you know, obviously, the lengths that Putin went to to take over strategic cash flows and the country's institutions, the, the court system, and so on once he came to power. I think the West was, was the West for, to some degree was naive in believing that nevertheless he would continue a path for integration with the West, um, that he would follow the rules of a Western global order. But really, um, I think obviously he, he might have thought he, he may be doing so in the beginning, but I think this sort of KGB mentality and this desire to restore Russia's global standing in the West became the overriding concern. And instead of doing so by building up his own country's economy, he preferred to resort to the methods that he'd grown up using, he'd got the ones he'd grown up in the KGB using, the same smuggling networks, the same kind of use of intermediaries and friendly firms to fund political operations abroad, to fund influence operations. And we see the kind of the consequences of all this in the present day uh, with all the funding of extreme left and extreme right parties in Europe and elsewhere in the West. Um, um, we see this in all the black cash that has been flooding into the West through various money laundering operations, which clearly go on with the oversight of the FSB. Obviously, there's a lot of stolen money, siphoned money in those money flows, but there's also kind of money connected to intelligence operations too, which is now uh, so complicated that it's very difficult for Western law enforcement to trace. Anyway, I'll leave it at that and hope you still have questions.